Okay, we are going to um, get started. I am Dr. Lisa Muirhead, Assistant Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 2021 Ada Fort Lecture. Um, we have a distinguished keynote speaker and an outstanding group of nurse leaders that will participate in the panel discussion. We are truly excited about today's program. I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, Benjamin Harris. Hello, my name is Benjamin Harris. I'm the Director of the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here in the School of Nursing. Today will be also an opportunity for us to unveil part one of our Hidden Figures project. Um, without any delays, we would um, like to turn the program over to Dr. John Lewin, Executive Vice President of Health Affairs, Emory University Executive Director of the Woodruff Health Science Center, and CEO and Chairman of the Board of Emory Healthcare. John. So uh, hopefully this just worked because I just, just ended up coming into the Zoom. So I uh, apologize if I'm a little glad I got in. Uh, so good afternoon and welcome to the 2021 Ada Fort Lecture. And I'd like to thank you, Dean McCauley, for inviting me to participate in the event. And a special thanks, of course, to our guest lecturer, Rear Admiral Dr. Sylvia Trent Adams. This annual lecture honors Ada Fort, who served as Dean of the Nell Hodgson Woodruff School of Nursing for 25 years. And true to Dean Fort's vision, this lecture brings together the finest minds in the field for innovative presentations and candid conversations around the issues most relevant to the nursing profession and patient care. Dr. Trent Adams will speak to us today on health disparities in relationship to the social determinants of health, which is a subject of crucial importance to our ability to provide quality care to the people and communities we serve. Because let's face it, even in the era of genomics and gene therapies, the interplay among genetics, behavior, and environment is complex and important. Or as Dr. Francis Collins once put it, when it comes to genes, genes load the gun, but environment pulls the trigger. So as long as social conditions such as poverty, racism, and others are widespread, there will continue to be disparities in healthcare. We can only achieve health equity for all by working to address and rectify the systemic social determinants of health, or let's say social determinants of dignity to ensure that all people have access to the highest quality care, that all patients achieve consistent outcomes no matter what they look like or where they live, and that all talented, compassionate students have equal opportunities to succeed in nursing and the health professions. I'm excited to hear Dr. Trent Adams' thoughts on the subjects, and so now I'd like to turn the program over to Dean Linda McCauley. Dean? Thank you, John. It's great to be with everyone today, and uh, this is a special event that honors the life and legacy of Ada Fort. As John said, she served 25 years as the Dean of the School of Nursing and she left uh, phenomenal uh, marks on nursing practice education and administration at the state level and the national level. I think Ada Fort's work paved the way to what the school is today she developed our first master's program when she was here. She also was the dean that admitted our first African-American um, students uh, to this graduate program in 1963. She was really a visionary. And those of you who study the history of nursing science, can understand the importance of Ada Ford and her voice in the South. She brought together health, business, faith, and community leaders to establish the International Nursing Service Association in 1972, which later became Global Health Action. And that program is still today and it assists more than 9,000 health professionals and community leaders around the world to strengthen and expand community-based health services for vulnerable underserved communities. So <clears throat> Ada Ford really paved the way for our values today of advanced education, research, 
social responsibility, and global health. And this lecture builds on her legacy. And it gives us a forum each year. This is um, the distinguished lecture that gives us a forum for national and international nursing leaders to present new ideas. And we have a phenomenal international leader with us today, Rear, Rear Admiral Dr. Sylvia Trent Adams, who's been such a longtime champion of public health. She was the former acting Surgeon General. And last fall, she went to Texas to become the Senior Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer, the University of North Texas Health Sciences Center. Dr. Trent Adams has held numerous leadership positions in the Department of Health and Human Services. She served for three years um, as the Deputy Surgeon, Surgeon General of the U.S. Public Health Services Commission Corps, leading more than 6,000 officers in the front lines of public health. She was a key value of the key advisor to the Surgeon General to combat the opiate addiction crisis. But before she joined the office of the Surgeon General, she worked in the HIV AIDS Bureau where she managed the Ryan White program, which funds medical care, treatment, referrals, and support for uninsured and underserved people living with HIV. She's been the recipient of multiple awards including the Meritorious Service Medal for Leadership, while she, uh, the Commission Corps responded to Ebola in West Africa. And she has received the International Red Cross Florence Nightingale um, Medal, which is the highest international honor given to a nurse. So we are so happy to have her with us today. I think she embodies what Ada Fort wanted us to keep doing in the school, particularly during this important Black History Month. She has so many honors, too many to describe to you here. Um, help join me with uh, welcoming uh, Sylvia and thank her for her work to improve public health, nursing and access to care for the poor and underserved communities. So welcome Dr. Trent Adams. Thank you so much, um, Dean McCauley. And I wanna say thank you to Dr. John, Levin, John Lewin for inviting us to be with you today. Um, thank you for the warm welcome and the opportunity to be a part of the 804 lecture series. I'm honored to be with you today. I wanna thank you all for your dedication and commitment to excellence in nursing education, research, leadership, and outstanding clinical service delivery. This is truly a remarkable time in our history. And I wanna say thank you for all that you've done across your campus and in the community in Atlanta to serve those who are in need. Um, my disclosure statements here, I have no financial disclosures that would be a potential conflict of interest with this presentation. The views and opinions expressed here are those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the official position of the University of North Texas Health Science Center. Um, our learning objectives for this presentation are to define health, health disparities and health inequities, discuss ways social determinants of health can potentially impact communities, describe barriers to achieving individual and population health, present pathways to address health inequities, and identify strategies to improve the health of underserved populations, and explore opportunities for the nursing profession to address health disparities. In full disclosure, I realize this is a complex and challenging topic, and I hope that today's presentation will create opportunities for us to start the conversation on how to make changes in our delivery system to address health disparities and inequities. There is so much I'd like to say on this topic. I'm very passionate about health disparities, um, but given the time that we have today, I hope we will at least have a chance to reflect on not only the challenges that we face, but also more importantly, how we can all be a part of the solution. So let's um, take a step back here. You know, I wanna, before we dive into our health disparities and health inequities, I'd like to just take a moment to look at how we define health. According to the WHO in 1948, Health, is, health was defined as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. We spend a lot of time talking about health, but we, and we also spend a lot of resources on it as well. You know, the United States spends more, fun, more on dollars on healthcare than any other developed nation. 
But why is this so important? Well, it impacts every aspect of our lives. Um, we spend so much time talking about health and we also need to understand that it does affect everything that we do in our lives. It affects the way we live. Um, it affects our ability to live a fulfilling life. It has a direct impact on the, on the health of our communities. So the factors that there, there are many factors that directly influence our health, some of which include food and nutrition, environment, mental well-being, um, health care, safe and stable housing, education, clean air and water supply, strong relationships and connectedness. Um, you know, there are so many things we could talk about in this context, but we rarely think about these factors as, as it relates to directly impacting health and health care. But as we know, these are part of the social determinants. In 1994, William Kissick wrote a book entitled Medicine's Dilemmas, Infinite Needs Versus Finite Resources. In this text, he presents the challenge of providing increased access to high quality health care while decreasing cost. He identifies challenges that face the healthcare delivery system. Many of the challenges he wrote about in 1994 continue to exist even today. When the ACA was enacted, it was intended to provide more people access to care while lowering the overall cost. But as it was implemented, healthcare costs significantly increased. And many jurisdictions um, had to make drastic decisions uh, around how to, to adjust prices so that people who did have care could continue to receive care. But many people were priced out of the market, which overlays some of the ongoing issues for the poor and underserved. Without significant structural changes to the models of health and healthcare delivery, decreased costs, improved access and high quality will remain elusive for so many. However, health insurance is not the only challenge to obtaining access to health and healthcare services. There are many individuals who have health insurance but do not have access to health care. There are many challenges outside the insurance market that impede one's ability to obtain health care services. Individuals may face structural barriers such as transportation, child care, geography, living in rural versus urban environments, social factors, and also system barriers such as regulatory, statutory, and policy issues. Population level differences in health, um, such as with um, disparities and inequities, as, as we will talk about in more detail later, and also socioeconomic factors that drive health indicators. So what are some of the benefits to having access to healthcare? While we face barriers to healthcare at all levels of the delivery system, there are significant benefits to having access to healthcare services. Some of these benefits include preventing disease and disability, detecting and treating illnesses and, or other health conditions, increasing quality of life, and, most, and also very importantly, increasing life expectancy. Without question, we recognize the important benefits of having access to healthcare. We must also acknowledge that there are many in this country who lack access to care and experience health disparities and inequities. In many policy circles, we grapple with the questions of what do health disparities look like in the United States and how do we identify inequities? Let's first take a minute to define health disparities. A health disparity is a situation whereby there is a disproportionate number of health conditions and deaths compared with the general population. This slide provides an example. African-Americans make up 13% of the US population but represent almost half of all new cases of HIV cases. This is a health disparity. Health disparities can exist anywhere. They may be in rural and urban settings across any state or region. They are economic as well as social causes of disparities. However, the impact in the same, is the same regardless of where disparities are found, poverty, low educational attainment and poor health outcomes with increased morbidity and mortality are directly linked to disparities. There are many areas of health disparities. Today, we'll look at a few that are often overlooked. According to the CDC, individuals who live in rural communities are at greater risk of death from five leading causes than urban areas. And those are heart disease, cancer, unintentional injury, chronic low respiratory disease, and strokes. Rural communities have a burden of disease that is unmatched by any of the other urban areas, partly due to access to healthcare services. Health literacy is another area of disparity that is often overlooked. 
As I mentioned before, low educational attainment is a key factor for health disparities. It also plays a role in, in patients with low health literacy. It also plays a role in how people access services that are available in their communities. Those with low health literacy are more likely to visit an emergency room, have more hospital stays, are less likely to follow treatment plans, and have higher mort mortality rates. It is often said that when we know better, we can do better. But in some cases, communities lack information and educational resources to make informed decisions regarding their health and health care. In those cases, we can make a positive impact through health education campaigns and community engagement. A health disparity refers to a higher burden of illness, injury, disability, or mortality experienced by one population group relative to another. A healthcare disparity typically refers to differences between groups and health insurance coverage. Access to and use of healthcare and quality of care also must be considered. Health and healthcare disparities often refer to differences that cannot be explained by variations in healthcare needs, patient preferences, or treatment recommendations. Disparities in health and healthcare in the United States have been a long standing challenge, resulting in some groups receiving less and lower quality healthcare than others. And experiencing poor health, or health related outcomes are also associated with these disparities. A complex and interrelated set of individual, provider, health systems, societal, and environmental factors contribute to disparities in health and health care. Factors that are commonly associated with health disparities include race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, gender, sexual identity, age, and geographic location. Health equity. Health equity are systematic differences in health and health status in different population groups. These inequities have significant social and economic costs both to individuals and societies. The impact of structural inequities follows individuals from womb to the tomb. This can include circumstances such as chronic stress associated with being treated differently by society or adverse, ch adverse childhood experiences such as trauma, limited educational opportunities and negative environmental exposures. It is often said that a picture is worth a thousand words. And I want to talk, I want to share this photo with you about equity versus equality. Equality means individual or group of a group of people is given the same resources or opportunities. So the same resources. Everyone gets an equal amount or equal share of an opportunity. Equity, however, recognizes that each person has different circumstances and allocates the exact resources and opportunities needed to reach an equal outcome. As depicted in this slide, equality has to do with giving everyone the exact same resources, whereas equity considers all of the distribution resources, distributing resources based on the needs of the recipients, which is based on a community model that we've talked about in healthcare over time, but equity and equality are two completely different factors. So what causes health inequities? According to the WHO, the social determinants of health are mostly responsible for health inequities. The unfair and unavoidable differences in health status seen within, within between countries, the structural roots of health inequities lie within education, taxation, labor and housing markets, urban planning, government regulation, healthcare systems, all of which are powerful determinants of health and ones over which individuals have little or no direct personal control, but can only be altered through social and economic policies and political processes. These are powerful words, but affect every single country on the globe. The complex integrated and overlapping social structures and economic systems that are responsible for most health inequities are rel relied, to, relied upon by communities across the world to better understand how equity and equality relates to those who in, in, engage in social determinants and relates, relates to the environmental context and constructs of health and health care. These social structures and economic systems include social government, social environment, I'm sorry, social environment, physical environment, health services, and structural and societal factors. 
Addressing social determinants of health is important for improving health and reducing long-standing disparities in health and in health care. The Kaiser Family Foundation developed a construct for looking at the social determinants of health several years ago. And you know, I wanna just kind of dive into the social determinants for a minute. So what exactly are the social determinants of health? The social determinants of health are the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. They include factors like socioeconomic economic status, education, neighborhood, and physical environment, employment, and social support networks, such as, as well as ac access to healthcare. In this table, we see the broad categories of the social determinants are economic stability, neighborhood and physical environment, education, food, community, and social context and healthcare system. These categories help us to understand the complex and interconnected variables required to achieve improved health outcomes. Many of these factors exist outside of the healthcare space, but have a tremendous impact on a community's ability to achieve health equity, decrease disparities, and improved access, costs, and quality. Overall, um, we have to look at the social determinants of health in the context of what it means for health and well being. Over half of all premature or early deaths in the United States are due to behavioral or other preventable factors. Only 10% of risk of premature death is attributed to healthcare. This indicates that substantive change in behavior and social and, and environmental factors could have a measurable impact on decreasing premature death. When considering the factors on the previous table, policies and innovation could be an could be very instrumental in a new and a new normal in addressing health disparities and inequities. In an effort to give more perspective to health disparities and health inequities, we do not have to look much further than what we have experienced with COVID-19. This pandemic has really had an impact on the entire world, but especially so in the United States amongst underserved populations. The COVID-19 mortality in Blacks, American Indians, Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, and Hispanics was much higher and has been, con continues to be much higher than whites. Of all these underserved populations, Blacks have had the highest mortality rate overall at 80 per 100,000 people in comparison to whites at 36 per 100,000 people, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation. Although Blacks might have had the highest mortality, they've had a much lower rate of hospitalizations as did Hispanics, as demonstrated in this um, slide from the hospitalizations by race amongst those the data collected by CDC for all of these populations across um, the United States. This next slide shows this, this, the disparities in deaths and cases among African-Americans in most states across the United States. The green shows deaths and cases that are less than proportional and yellow to red indicates those states where the deaths and cases were much were more than proportional. So as you can see, there's very little green here as it relates to deaths in comparison to even fewer as it relates to cases. So if the African-Americans are, are showing more cases and they're also showing more deaths in the previous slide on hospitalizations, we should see a bit of a difference if there were not disparities and inequities. But there are definitely disparities and inequities as we have heard from the CDC on African-Americans and other minority groups such as Hispanics and Native Americans who have not been able to access healthcare for COVID-19. But that is not only um, where we see some of these disparities. Racial disparities in the COVID pandemic overall has shown that Afri Black or African-Americans the death rate per 100,000 as of July 2020 was 74 per 100,000. We know that that number has now increased from 74 to 80 per 100,000. And the numbers have not changed that much over time. We see that the death rate um, for whites did go up by six per 100,000 from 30 to 36, but African Americans and um, American Indians and Alaska Native and Hispanics remain highest of all populations that have died from COVID-19. Black Americans are less likely to say they would get the COVID-19 vaccine, even if it was free um, and was determined to be safe by, by scientists. 
And vaccine hesitancy is not a new um, issue for underserved and, and minority populations. We know that um, with inf seasonal influenza, also um, African Americans and Hispanics are less likely to get the vaccine than um, our white counterparts. But specifically with the COVID-19 um, vaccine, we know that we've had significant number of cases being higher in the Black and Hispanic community and the higher number of deaths in the Black and Hispanic community, but they're much less likely to accept vaccines um, for COVID-19 based on this study that was done back in September of 2020. So what has COVID-19 showed us about um, health and healthcare for minority and underserved populations? It really has shined a bright light on um, the problems and challenges that we face with underserved communities across the entire country and even across the world. Last week, we learned from the CDC that since COVID-19, <clears throat> the life expectancy in the United States has dropped by a year. But if you look at the next slide, a closer look shows that the life expectancy of Blacks and Hispanics has dropped even more than the US average. Blacks, we have, that has dropped by 2.7 years, and for Hispanics, 1.9 years, and for non-Hispanics, whites, 0.8 years. This infographic shows the health disparities among African Americans. And we sh it shows that African Americans are more likely to die at earlier ages from all causes. Regardless of age for high blood pressure, diabetes and stroke, African Americans are not only dying earlier, but at higher rates. This, shot, this slide shows us the cancer health disparities across the country. Minority populations die from cancer at higher rates than non-minority populations. For example, African American men have, have a prostate cancer death rate that is more than twice that for white men. Hispanic children are 20% more likely to develop leukemia than non-Hispanic white children. Asian Pacific Islander adults are twice as likely to die from stomach cancer as white adults. And American Indian Alaska Native adults are twice as likely to develop liver and bile duct cancer as white adults. Adolescents and young adults age 15 to 39 with head and neck cancer who have no insurance are 51% more likely to die from their disease than those who have private insurance. Men living in the poorest U.S. counties have a colorectal cancer death rate that is 35% higher than that of men living in the most affluent U.S. counties. And bisexual women are 70% more likely to be diagnosed with cancer than heterosexual women. The United States of America is known by many as a medical powerhouse. It is home to some of the best hospitals in the world. Groundbreaking research is done in hospitals and universities across the nation, setting the standard for state-of-the-art care and procedures. It is shocking to many, however, that the United States is a, has the highest rate of maternal death in the developed world. As you see on this slide, the United States far exceeds other developed nations as it relates to maternal mortality. If we look at the pregnancy-related deaths, um, according to the CDC, between 2007 and 20, 2016, pregnancy-related deaths in the United States occur in Black women at a much higher rate than white women and American Indian and Alaska Native women. Black women have a 41 per 100,000 live births um, deaths in comparison to white women, which have 13 deaths per 100,000 live births. Even when you look at the data across education level, Black women still suffer death during pregnancy at a much higher rate than white women and American Indian and Alaska Native women. But it doesn't only end with um, maternal mortality. If we look at global infant mortality rates as of 2017, and this data has not changed significantly over the last 10 years, um, the US ranks highest for infant mortality for developed nations. Next slide. If we look at infant mortality rates by race, race and ethnicity as of 2018, similar findings exist for infant mortality for black, for, for black children as for um, over time in comparison to um, maternal mortality rates. We see that non-Hispanic black um, children 
the, the rate, the infant mortality rate is 10.8 in comparison to non-Hispanic white children at 4.6 per 100,000. In general, people with higher incomes live longer than those with lower incomes. This is attributed to better living conditions, healthcare, and better behavior. At least that's been the assumption. But if you look at, the, if you think about the previous slide where I showed you the um, maternal mortality rates based on education and income, those are not necessarily holding true for black women, especially as it relates to maternal mortality and infant mortality. Next slide. We look at for both men and women, more education should mean, and it often does mean longer life. According to our, the RWJ study, college graduates can expect to live for at least five years longer than individuals who have not finished high school. Educational attainment is linked to mortality as well as um, health equity and health disparities. Now, we have to look at children in a very distinctly different way because we look at our future through our kids. And children who live in poverty, and this study that was done at NYU and at the McSilver Institute, shows that children who live in poverty have lower levels of educational attainment. Um, and th those kids who have lower educational attainment are more likely to score lower on standardized tests, um, be held back a grade, drop out of high school, they're less likely to get a college degree, and they attend schools with fewer resources, suffer from poor nutrition, chronic stress, and other health problems that are interfere with their schoolwork, and they change residences in schools frequently as their families struggle to find affordable housing. And overall, children raised in poverty have lower earning wages and are more likely to live in poverty as adults. So this really does start um, with our kids. CDC estimates that 10% of premature mortality is due to inadequate health care. 98% of health care dollars are spent on health care instead of prevention. Increasing differences in access to care is based on deductibles, co-pays, and other co-insurance costs, which can be a barrier for individuals accessing um, health care. And lower access to tests, such as specialty care, um, specialty tests um, and also specialty care um, exists for low income patients. So as we look at the social determinants of health, what are some of the strategies that we can employ to improve equity? Well, we can increase the number of initiatives to address social determinants of health within and outside of the healthcare system. We need structural change, not just healthcare solutions. We need development of policies and practices in non-health sectors to promote health and health equity, both um, from the environmental space as well as from the healthcare space. We need collaboration. We need multi-payer and multi-sectoral initiatives focused on addressing social needs, as well as um, federal, state, local, and private sources coming in um, to communities to improve access to those uh, new initiatives that'll leverage the business proposition for making health a priority. We need to improve health literacy. Health literacy is directly linked to access and also um, to follow-up care. And we need to find ways to engage communities, meet people where they are to provide services to best meet their needs on the local level. As we look at improving health equity or an equity overall, we must develop community-based solutions, solutions that are driven by and in response to community needs such as increasing the supply of providers. Um, we need to look at how we create the appropriate mix of providers. Not every community needs five more doctors. They may need more nurses or more social workers to address behavioral health needs versus direct clinical primary care services. Community engagement to identify community needs, non-traditional models of care, models that have yet to be invented. Who would have ever thought prior to COVID-19 that telehealth would be such a high demand service in our communities right now. Um, but necessity drives a lot of invention. Community and individual empowerment. We need to empower our patients to make decisions and request the services that they need. And also work with community health centers, um, both federally funded and the um, non-federally um, um, funded um, health centers that are in their local communities, both rural and urban, 
to make sure the services that are needed for underserved populations can be sustained and continued over time. We need major disruptions of the status quo. Through innovation and entrepreneurship, we can create new opportunities for new models to be developed that will better meet the needs and decrease costs and improve quality for um, those patients who access our services. And creating pipeline programs for recruitment from the community to increase the likelihood that people who understand the culture and the language of a given community will come back to serve in those, in those underserved areas or even increase the likelihood of individuals who access those services over time will be from those communities and serve the individuals that they um, are familiar with. So what are some of the strategies to improve health equity and equality? Well, this is a bit a, a more of a challenge because it, will, it, it creates a new dynamic of creating opportunities for leadership to be, be involved, leadership at all levels. We need to create that commitment to support um, and promote diversity at all levels of the organization at the decision-making table at the C-suite, as well as at the, at the bedside and in the community providing direct care. Engage with the patients, families, and community stakeholders in a deliberate way to understand the unique needs of the community. Strategic planning with meaningful input from stakeholders of all levels. Um, many times we develop stakeholder models that involve the leadership of organizations, but we also need to have conversations with people who access services from these organizations that are in the community. And look at mission statements and policies that reflect values and principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We will never get out of the disparities and inequities frame of mind if we don't make significant changes in what we stand for and how we implement those mission and missions and visions on a daily basis. Recruitment and retention of diverse staff. I cannot emphasize this enough. Um, there's, there are a wealth of studies out there that show that concordance between provider and the patients and in, in given, and especially in underserved communities, significantly improve the retention and recruitment of, of individuals with very complex um, diseases. And for diabetes and cancer, that is so critical for us to have um, patients who will not only access care, but retain um, their, their medical home over time to have better outcomes. Targeted self, self service delivery standards based on needs of the community. We have to understand that we cannot be all things to all people. And, and create models whereby people can access the services that they need where they are. Not everyone is ready to enter into um, complex care or, or specialty care when they first come into the door. So we need very targeted service delivery models and standards to help people meet the needs that they have at that particular point in time, which will increase their, the likelihood of them staying in care over the period of time that they're needed. So what is that nursing has to do with all of this? And here's where I would typically get on my soapbox and talk about the importance of nurses, but it's true. Nurses spend more time with patients, either in the community or inside an inpatient facility or an outpatient facility than any other health healthcare um, member of the team. And we are critical to the healthcare delivery um, system. We're the largest um, healthcare profession, not only in the United States, but also in the world. And we must be informed. We must be informed about the needs of our patients, how to be sensitive and compassionate and empathetic for those individuals who come into our space. We must be engaged and understand what's going on with our patients and in the community. We must advocate for our patients to make sure that their needs are being met and that we understand the differences between equity and equality. Educating patients, communities, and colleagues around disparities and, and health inequities and, and, and health, um, health gaps that exist in their in the, in community, but also help to recognize opportunities to address those structural, structural disparities and inequities. What I've learned um, in working with underserved populations is that we can be a game changer if we choose to do so, but we have to develop and implement strategies to improve health, health care, and equity in health care, while we're also creating opportunities for people to have access to health insurance. It does not stop with health insurance. We have to go further. So as I'm starting to wrap up here, you know, I wanted to leave something with you that was, would resonate hopefully with um, you over time. And that is first and foremost, we all have a role to play. We need multidisciplinary teams to solve problems. None of us can do this by ourselves. There is no one size fits all approach in serving underserved or diverse populations. 
And I do believe that nurses can be the innovators in creating value, the value proposition for improved equity and outcomes in health and healthcare. We are change agents and we know how to do this well. Changing needs are not always obvious and perspectives on how healthcare is viewed and by the community can help us all to better serve, build better services and also to serve our patients in a more um, empathetic way. Challenges can be opportunities. Um, we, we can use the lessons learned from COVID-19 to better inform new systems, new models and new practices as we move forward because healthcare really is a dynamic process. Um, but I think that we should be the role models we want um, for the future. We have to be role models for change. Those role models that we want to see, we need to be those role models and take charge for our profession as well as for the healthcare delivery systems that our patients um, access. I leave you with a quote from the legendary Rosa Parks, and I quote, to bring about change, you must not be afraid to take the first step. We will fail when we fail to try, end quote. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to be a part of the 804 lecture series. It has truly been an honor and a privilege, Godspeed. And I look forward to discussion on our talk later today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Trent Adams for such an informative presentation. Hello, everybody. My name is Rosalind Jean-Louis. I am a second year PhD student at Emory School of Nursing, and I am studying the impacts of racism and discrimination on maternal health outcomes among Black women in the United States. I am honored to introduce our three distinguished panelists, Dr. Brianna Lathrop, Dr. Gina Papa, and Tawanda Austin. Dr. Brianna Lathrop is the Chief Operating Officer and Nurse Practitioner at Good Samaritan Health Center in Atlanta, Georgia. She has spent over a decade providing health care to individuals and families who lack health insurance. Dr. Latham earned her Doctor of Nursing practice from Georgia Southern University, as well as her Master of Nursing and Master of Public Health from Emory University. She is passionate about health equity and addressing social determinants of health. She writes and speaks on these topics and is the co-author of How Neighbors Make Us Sick, Restoring Health and Wellness to Our Communities. Dr. Lathrop is a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Culture of Health Leader and the co-founder of the Coronavirus Support Network. Dr. Gina Papa is a graduate at the Emory School of Nursing and serves as the clinic administrator at the Clarkson Community Health Center in Clarkson, Georgia. Dr. Papa personifies compassion in action as she transforms the clinic's vision to provide quality, compassionate care to over 4,500 4, community members who are uninsured and at 200% of the federal po poverty level. As, doctor, as graduate student, Dr. Papa aided in establishing Emory's University's um, nurse-led Wednesday clinics, quality improvement projects, and nurse-led intake and triage protocols. A skilled leader, leader and innovator in higher education, Dr. Papa's background motivates her to help reduce barriers in healthcare. She has led nonprofit leadership positions as former president of Serve Haiti and is a founding member of the Landon Paget Memorial Fund and sits on the Dean's Advisory Boards for Arts and Sciences at Clayton State University. Tawanda Austin, MSN RN, is the Chief Nursing Officer at Emory University Hospital Midtown, where she is responsible for nursing practice. She works to establish nursing excellence as a distinctive competency throughout the hospital. Tawanda holds a master in science degree from Emory School of Nursing and a bachelor in science in nursing from Kennesaw State University. She has personal and professional commitment to developing and mentoring the next generation of nurse leaders who will serve as quality and safety advocates for patients and families. Tawanda's mission as chief nursing officer is to, pro pro to promote and enhance the image of nursing within her organization, the community and within the nursing profession. Tawanda has been awarded the Daisy Nurse Leader Award, which honors leaders who make a difference in patient care through their leadership. She is a member and current chair of the board of directors for the Clifton School and is a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Thank you so much for taking the time for, to being with us today. And I will turn it over to our moderators, Dr. Alexis, Alexis Dunn Amor and Katiana Carey Sims RN. Thank you, Rose, for those wonderful introductions. We will now move into the question and answer portion of the lecture. Again, my name is Dr. Alexis Donna Moore. I'm a research assistant professor and nurse midwife here at the School of Nursing with the research focus on the evaluation of health disparities as well as maternal mortality during the perinatal period. 
I'm joined by one of our student leaders and activists, Katiana. Katiana, would you like to introduce yourself? Good afternoon. My name is Katiana Carey Sims. I'm currently a second degree master's student on the midwifery track. My life's work is committed to reproductive justice, sexual health, black birth equity, and dismantling structural determinants of health. I'm super grateful to be here with you all today. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here with Katiana. We're, we're truly a team. So we have a few questions prepared to start this conversation with our panelists. And so with that being said, we would like to ask our first question to Dr. Brianna Lathrop. So many feel that the term social determinants of health doesn't adequately include the role of historical injustice that persists within structural entities and that the term masks the systemic component to inequities. Some prefer the term structural violence. Could you please share with us your thoughts on how the conditions and systems in which people live, learn, work, and grow affect their health outcomes? How can nurses address systemic and structural oppression within these systems? Great. Right. Thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this conversation. I'm going to just share a few slides to illustrate um, some of these points, hopefully um, better than just words alone. I'm a nurse practitioner and I work here on the west side of Atlanta at Good Samaritan Health Center. We're in the zip code 30318, right on the border between that zip code and 30314. And the life expectancy of the people living within that neighborhood currently is 63.6 years. Now, if you drive 20 minutes north into the Vinings area, life expectancy is 87.2 years. That is a life expectancy gap of 23.6 years. So I use this illustration to start the conversation to really emphasize what Dr. Trent Adams said so well is that social determinants of health aren't just risk factors. These are systemic disparities that cause trauma and physical damage to the people that experience these inequities in our nation. We serve a variety of patients from various neighborhoods and walks of life at Good Samaritan. Um, just to name a few in terms of illustrating how social determinants of health impact patients as someone um, working in patient care, we um, specifically serve a lot of people experiencing homelessness. We have legacy residents who live in Atlanta's west side and have been there for generations. Many of our patients would be classified as working poor, working numerous jobs within the same family and still at 200% federal poverty level or less. And many are immigrants, both documented and undocumented. Some social determinants of health are certainly shared across various groups and some unique to certain groups <clears throat> or even individuals. For those patients experiencing homelessness, almost all have an experience with violence, many both before and during homelessness. They've been trapped in violent situations because leaving them would be a loss of housing. Many have also experienced violence at the hands of our supposed justice system in terms of incarceration. Um, chronic disability, often that is re not recognized and therefore not associated with benefits, has a negative impact on this population. For our West Side residents, structural racism is a major component of life on the West Side in terms of access to good education, fair housing practices, and certainly with the stadium and the Beltline, gentrification is occurring at a rapid pace and often pricing people out of the neighborhoods they deserve to stay in. Food insecurity is ranked the number one social determinant consistently in community evaluations in that neighborhood. For those working, especially during COVID-19, there's ongoing problems of managing the stress of employment with trying to navigate housing, poverty, childcare, transportation to and from work. And for our immigrant population, there's often a lack of legal protection or options in terms of legal practices and employment and housing and fair treatment, as well as difficulties in language barriers that often further exacerbate these inequities. So what does that mean in terms of clinical care? Um, being someone that provides direct patient services, I like to understand too the pathophysiology um, to your question, Lexi, about like how does this actually occur? And we know that the human body was designed to handle stress, but not the chronic daily stress that's bred of our inequitable systems. So this constant fear of where will I get food? How will I make it? Where am I gonna live? Are my kids gonna be okay? Impacts the body in permanent ways. 
Now, certainly this chronic stress is filtered through these mitigating or enhancing fa factors. I think it's important to name that of all these different communities that we interact with or that we serve at Good Sam, they have resiliency and have often found their own power and their own community support systems because the system has not provided it and has systematically disadvantaged them. There are also differences in genetics and access to support systems. But as chronic stress filters through these other factors, what we see are changes to the DNA, permanent alterations to the neuro and endocrine systems, which directly correlate to increased rates of hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, premature death, premature labor, um, and a host of other chronic conditions that then we are treating in the clinical setting. Layered on this is the complexity that when we're treating in the clinical setting, we are spending less time on direct patient care and more time navigating, trying to find out where people can go, how to make connections, how to figure out which medications are affordable and where to get them. So you have this increased risk along with inadequate resources to help people navigate these systems. So what do we do as nurses? Um, and I think this is where it's really important to understand this concept of structural violence, that we have to understand that these social determinants of health and health inequities are systemic problems causing trauma to people. And that these inequities were designed, we have created social and political norms and behaviors within our society that were created to give power and income and resources to some at the disadvantage of others. And so undoing this, to me, I like to think of it as three levels of change, personal change, system change, and policy change. Um, as a white woman, certainly implicit bias is my responsibility to identify in myself and mitigate in my clinical practice, as well as in all the decisions that I make. That I have to understand my own biases and narratives so that I help patients versus causing more damage. And all of us have implicit bias, not only along racial lines, but in terms of poverty, mental illness, substance abuse, that when we commit to that uncomfortable truth and unlearning and relearning, we deliver better care and we are better citizens in our other decision-making. For me, this means moving from this question of what's wrong with you in the exam room to what happened to you and applying an equity lens to the various decisions I make around where I shop, how I vote, these day-to-day -day decisions, understanding that that creates health and wellness or disparity. As Dr. Trent Adams mentioned, you know, the healthcare system alone can't solve this. We need systemic change in food access, transportation, housing, but I tell people, start with the system that you care about and where you're at. And if that's healthcare, every piece matters. From education, it's ingraining social determinants into our curriculum. Um, thinking about it not just as a lecture or a class, but as a piece of every single thing we do as we prepare to be clinicians. That in our healthcare settings, whether big systems or small clinics, setting up monitoring, measuring systems to identify health disparities, and then challenging ourselves to create alternative healthcare delivery models and rely on other alternative team members that may be better equipped to address these programs. For me, that's meant working with community um, health leaders as well as certified peer specialists that have been instrumental in helping me better understand the community and deliver cares in ways that were blind spots to me. We need to move towards screening and assess assessing social determinants of health for all patients, thinking about them the way we do blood pressure or depression screening, and that we go beyond just interdisciplinary collaboration to cross-sector collaboration. Who are the lawyers, the community leaders, the educators that we partner with to make change, and how do we develop networks in which we share and communicate information efficiently? And I'll end with just a reminder that as bedside nurses and as people delivering direct care, we need to care and meet social needs. But we would be remiss in saying that meeting social needs is addressing social determinants of health. These are systemic violent problems that need systemic solutions. And so remember that your other role as a nurse is that you are ambassadors of that information, that your personal journey of learning, of identifying bias, of changing clinical practice, your personal experiences of seeing how social determinants of health play out in the real lives of your patients can fuel conversations that change people. 
One of my favorite quotes is that people learn by stories, not data. And you are those stories. And that when you use that in everywhere you go, you start to create the system level change that we need to address these inequities. That remember that your decisions both within and outside the healthcare system matter to promoting health equity. Thank you, Brianna. That was just beautifully stated. I, I, I can't, I don't think any of us could have said it better. And I, the one thing that you said to me that I think summarizes it completely, completely is we have to shift from asking patients what's wrong with you to what happened to you. I think that's very profound. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll move on to our question two with Dr. Gina Papa. So we're talking today about social determinants of health structurally how our profession, specifically, excuse me, how our profession of nursing and the structure of our society affects health in inequitable ways. What challenges, Dr. Papa, have you faced in addressing social determinants of health? And what are your thoughts on ways to eliminate disparities and moving the needle towards true equity? It wouldn't be- Apologies. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, you for that question. And I am so grateful to participate on this panel discussion. Um, I wanted to echo um, the what is, what has happened to you rather than what is wrong with you that Brianna had mentioned. And you also had mentioned talking about screening for social determinants to health and cross-sectional collaboration. So I really appreciated that comment. Um, as I pull up my, my presentation, um, I want to share stories from our clinic. And at Clarkson Community Health Center, we are in America's most diverse mile. Oftentimes we're called the Ellis Island of the South. And we serve patients who are at 200% and below the federal poverty level who would fit into multiple categories and also cross-sectional categories and intersectional categories, if you will. Um, we have patients who are undocumented, documented immigrants, patients who are seeking asylum, patients who are native born, patients who um, are immigrants and refugees. And in nursing, we are taught whole person care and patient-centered care and community-based nursing because we are one of the most trusted professions. Our nurses have unique insights into our patients' lives outside the hospital bed or in our case, outside of the clinic. The adult patients that we serve at Clarkston Community Health Center are at 200% below the federal poverty level and do not have insurance. So we are the safety net of the safety nets. They live in multi-generational households, speak more than one language in their home. Our hourly wage earners typically share one phone with a limited data plan and do not have reliable transportation. Our adult patients work in grocery, convenience stores, gas stations. They are delivery drivers, fast food chain operators. They work in hospitality industry, construction, landscaping, domestic labor, the gig economy with ride sharing and shopping services. And oftentimes, especially during coronavirus, they were either unemployed or underemployed, or they were our essential workers that were not given the coverage um, available to them that we in the healthcare community um, had um, access to. Even in limited supplies, um, those of us in healthcare did have access to PPE, while a lot of our patients working in meatpacking industries were not given proper PPE. So I wanna share a little bit of those stories. So I feel that there's multiple needles <laughs> that we will be moving toward equitable health and multiple levers for us to pull. And as nurses, we have many hats that we wear and many responsibilities. So it's a matter of, as Brianna had mentioned, um, you know, I wanna reframe a little bit and talk a bit about our spheres of influence and how can we learn to navigate seamlessly between our spheres of influence, whether it be our nurse to patient, nurse to nurse and nurse to organization. So in each of these spheres, we could seek to educate either ourselves um, or our um, patients. We can practice humility, build partnerships and demand accountability. So I wanna call your attention. I'm kind of like the resource gal at our clinic and I'll post these in the chat room window. Please become very, very knowledgeable about the CDC social vulnerability index and other geospatial research dashboards that speaks to highlighting health and equity and disparities. Um, Emory Rollins School of Public Health has also created a COVID-19 health equity interactive dashboard, and I'll post those in the chat room window. So I'm gonna talk about some of the, um, in, uh, 
the 20, uh, the, excuse me, the Healthy People 2030 challenges. And I'm gonna talk about several um, places where we at Clarkson Community Health Center have experienced social determinants to health. So in terms of economic stability, our patients need affordable, equitable access to participate in the economy. We need to advocate for fair wages, paid leave, safe working conditions, food security, childcare, and low cost medications, especially for diabetes, asthma, and heart disease. So educate yourself nurses on what a typical working wage is in your area. Find out where your patients shop for groceries and understand their food and medications budgets. Here's a way in which we address that barrier at Clarkson Community Health Center over the summer. A Nepali immigrant family recently moved to the United States and was here for less than a month. The husband had tested positive for COVID-19 and is, was working in the chicken processing um, plant. He had just started his job and he tested positive. We provided him at our clinic with the um, positive test result. We gave him a call through the use of an interpreter and we also gave him a work excuse. He called us back and said he could not stay at home and um, shelter in place or self quarantine and isolate. Instead, he had to go to work. So we talked to him about how he can be safe. He could share a ride with six other um, men and women to drive an hour to the facility and back, wear a mask, wash his hands, maintain as much social distance as he can, and then try not to infect his wife and 10 year old son. She tested positive. Um, she recovered and had very few symptoms as well as a husband and the son was fine. What we also provided to them was a week's worth through a partnership that we created with a local charitable organization. We provided them with a week's worth of groceries and prepared meals that were tailored to their cultural preferences. Education, access, and quality. We need to advocate for affordable, equitable access at all levels, primary, secondary, vocational, post-secondary, and professional. This also means advocating for the digital, digital divide. You heard that I had said most of our patients only have access to a cell phone. Well, if you look globally, 46% of the world's population is not connected to the internet. And in the United States alone, our Latinx and Hispanic immigrants, 44% of them do not have access to a computer. So when these stay-at-home orders um, occurred and children were enrolled in school, what happened to those young men and women and children who should be logging in and um, participating in their Zoom calls. How do our patients fill out applications um, for employment? Many of our families have access to one mobile device that has a limited data plan. We transitioned to a telehealth model where we thought that we would be using Zoom calls and video conferencing like this, but we soon learned that probably maybe one out of every 10 of our patients had access and we quickly transition to using a platform that allows for voice over IP, which is a secure line to connect our patients with a phone call. And we've been doing telehealth through phone calls with the use of interpreters, providers, and nurses online since March of last year. We have partnered with local healthcare and refu refugee support agencies. And as of um, two weeks ago, we sent out notifications to all of our 65 plus patients through the phone app and on their uh, cell phones to let them know that they were eligible for the Moderna vaccine. Um, I even helped some of our patients because of the vaccine, we needed to fill out an application online. And so you have to be cognizant about who you're reaching and what languages or what, um, what barriers they may have. So a lot of our patients who are 80 plus and even in the 70 plus crowd um, needed help and access to filling out the form and myself and some of our volunteers filled out that form and helped them find their way to get the vaccine. Healthcare access and quality. We need to advocate for affordable, equitable access to healthcare. So did you know that a typical inhaled corticosteroid for asthma, budisodone, the cost is about an average of $292 for one inhaler? for 60 doses. Um, a cheaper nebulize, nebulizer vial is available for $61 a month. But can you take a nebulizer to your job on an assembly line? If you're working in the meat processing facility, can you take time off to not only take a puff of an inhaler, but to, do a, to take a nebulizer treatment? Diabetes, 
one out of every $4 spent on healthcare goes toward caring for a person with diabetes. And this is averaging 16, over $16,000 a year. We at Clarkson Community Health Center have free insulins for our patients who are um, diabetic. We primarily care for type two diabetics who um, require insulin. And we also use platforms that try to find alternatives for um, cheaper and low cost medications. So I encourage you nurses to check cash prices at pharmacies, use aggregator apps to shop for best, for best prices. And when all else fails, help patients apply for prescription assistance programs. Caveat for our patient population, many prescription assistance programs require that you include a social security number. So we have to fall back on, again, um, using those cash prices at pharmacies and alternative um, medications. And then lastly, access to free low cost or sliding scale preventative and screening services and interventions. We had access to free vaccines for influenza. Um, as of um, about three or four weeks ago, we were approved to receive the Moderna vaccine for COVID-19, yet I check every day <laughs> and I don't know when we're gonna get our vaccine supply. So I will post in the chat box how you can um, join us to volunteer to give vaccine when that's available. We do have access to free screening mammograms and follow-up services. Um, colonoscopies, that has been um, interesting. So looking outside of the box, using fecal occult, occult blood cards for um, yearly screenings, and then finding other locations and grant services and providers that provide um, low-cost colonoscopy services. Cervical cancer screenings, HIV, high blood pressure, all of these things require thinking outside of the box and making those, reaching out to local partners who may already have those grant monies and available resources. I would also like to note that we have over 400 volunteer clinicians that include RNs, PAs, NPs, MDs, DOs, um, and nursing students as well. Our ambulatory care um, nursing students rotate through Clarkson Community Health Center and we're doing telehealth. And lastly, for neighborhood and built environment, I'd like for us to all encourage ourselves to go back and look at the history of housing policies and how racial discrimination in the United States has occurred. I recently came across a lecture um, about the color of law, which is writ written by Richard Rothenstein, who's affiliated with the Nonpartisan Economic Policy Institute. He goes into a deep analysis about how um, the policies that have been enacted by um, state, local, and national governments have created this inequity. I'll include that in there. But what you can do as nurses is advocate for affordable quality housing at your local town hall meetings, in the media, local, state, and elected officials. Speak about the poor health outcomes, your increased rates of asthma, increased rates of infectious diseases, increased complications to cardiovascular disease, and poor mental health outcomes. Um, I will pause with that and um, put some other um, information in the chat room. Our patients at Clarkson Community Health Center are amazing and they share stories of resilience and, and um, recovery. We have lost some of our patients to COVID-19 and do mourn their losses, but I also wanna highlight the amazing resilience of our immigrant, refugee, non-native and native born populations. In fact, one of, um, my uh, one of my favorite patients who is trying to um, uh, adopt a, a young child that she is a foster mama for is a black woman who is underemployed. And I reach out to her every week and ask her for her blood pressure and blood sugar logs. And every now and again, she'll send me a log and she'll tell me how she's doing. And she said, please don't give up on me. It's been a rough week. And so I share with her, you got this, you can do this, we're here for you. And just being that um, ear and listening to our patients, asking them, how can we help? How can we be of service? What can we do to address your needs? And spending that extra time and listening um, has been, really made a difference. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Papa, for those comments. It's so important to recognize the concrete ways in which the social determinants of health and structural determinants of health intersect and how to address those with concrete solutions and really understand where people are coming from. Thank you so much. I'll move on to the third, third question. So our next question is to Chief Nursing Officer Tawanda Austin. So bear with me, I have a little bit of a blurb and then a question, okay? 
So the evidence suggests that systemic oppression within healthcare institutions have a direct correlation to healthcare delivery and outcomes. While there are national calls to address racism and health inequities by the American Nurses Association, the American Association of Colleges of Nursing, and other professional organizations, other healthcare organizations, the systems that are faced with these calls may be the very systems that perpetuate disparities themselves. With that in mind, how can nurse leaders implement successful strategies to advance health equity when confronted with structural and systemic racism and resistance? What specific examples can you share in working with populations at Emory University Hospital Midtown? Good afternoon. Um, I would like to start with this presentation and then I'll go back and answer your questions. Um, so again, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tawanda Austin and I am the Chief Nursing Officer at Emory University Hospital uh, Midtown. So just to share a bit about Midtown, just a quick overview. So we're a 529 bed tertiary care facility that is located in Midtown Atlanta. We see approximately 65,000, we have 65,000 visits in our emergency department um, each year. And then we see approximately 38,000 patients that are admitted to our inpatient unit um, per year. And if you look at our primary service areas, um, those include cardiology, we see patients for cardiac surgery, neurosurgery, cancer, orthopedics, emergency medicine, and women's services. So this slide just demonstrates what our primary service area is. And our primary service area is the area in which we see 75% or greater of our patients um, actually originate from these six counties in the metro Atlanta area. And those include DeKalb, Fulton, Gwinnett, Cobb, Henry, and Clayton counties. So a snapshot um, about our, our community here at Midtown. So if you see this data was collected in 2019. And so if you look over to the left of the slide, you'll see that we see in the, in the yellow, 52% uh, of our patients were females and 48% were males. And then on the right side of this slide, what you will see is um, our population um, of patients related to our race and ethnicity. So we have about 40% of our patients are African-American or black. Um, we have about 37% of our patients that are, are white and then a 12% Hispanic population and then 8% um, of Asian and Pacific Islanders. And then we have a few about 3% that don't fit into any of those categories. So more information about our demographics. Um, so what you'll see here is our population of patients that's just, um, codified by age group, their educational level, their insurance coverage, and their household income. So what I would just, you know, concentrate on on this slide is that um, if you look on the right, you see that about 68% of our patients have some college education, whether that's um, an associate degree, a bachelor's degree, or higher. Um, and then the remaining percentage of, of those patients, which is about 32% or so, um, have a high school degree, have some high school or less than a high school education. If you look at the bottom right, this depicts um, our insurance coverage, right? So we have 64% of our patients, which is a fairly high rate that have managed care. And then about 14% I'll highlight um, is, is uninsured. And so just to um, really briefly talk about um, mortality and morbidity measures, you can see that on the left, um, if you look at our age adjusted death rate, um, and you can see Georgia um, is about 800 per 100,000. And then in the green, you see our, our, our service area is about 689, which overall is less than what we see in the state of Georgia. But if you look further, you can see that our highest um, death rates for our service area is Clayton County and Henry County. And one thing that I will say about Clayton County that we know, I think there's about a little over 70% of, a pay, of, of uh, Clayton County is African-American. And if you um, turn to the right side of this slide, you can see our fetal mortality rate. Um, and this is, you know, 1,000 fetal deaths per birth. Again, if you look at Georgia compared to our um, service area in the green, we are higher. But again, if you look at Clayton County, much higher in Clayton County and in DeKalb County compared to our um, average um, service area and then to the state of Georgia. A um, bit more about uh, mortality and morbidity. Um, if you look on the right, so in this yellow um, table, what you see is um, our causes, the top causes of death for our patients here at Midtown. And you see that our top two causes of death 
um, for uh, major cardiovascular diseases and cancers. And so just general health measures about the Midtown community. So we see patients um, with a, a variety of diseases, but um, you can see those listed here. And for sake of time, I won't go through those. But the one thing that I will highlight, if you look in the bottom right of this slide under our maternal and child health, um, you can see again that um, the percentage of low birth weights um, um, for Clayton County, again, um, far surpasses um, many of our other counties in our service area. And it does, and it is a bit higher than what we see in the state of Georgia. Again, recognizing just um, for information or context that we have about 70% of patients coming out of Clayton County are African-American. And so I wanted to just provide a bit more context um, and impact and drivers of uh, social determinants of health. And so again, I'm gonna show you some information that we received. Um, so when Emory did our, um, our community needs assessment, we actually partnered with about 50 organizations. And these organizations are, are organizations that have a broad interest and have special knowledge um, with, on the specific health needs of our patients and families within our service area. They have special knowledge on the public health in the community that we serve here at um, Emory. And then also have special knowledge on the health needs of the underserved low-income and minority uh, populations of patients in the communities that we serve here at Midtown. And so I wanted to provide again, some of this information. And these are just basic questions that we ask, trying to get to what are the issues that um, our patients and our service area um, is, is facing. And so um, just examples. Um, first question that we ask is, in your opinion, who are the people or groups of people in your county whose health or quality of life may not be as good as others and, and why? And then we ask for them to note any specific zip codes or area codes where the health disparities or where there was pockets of poverty. Um, another question is, what do you think are some of the root causes for these challenges? And what are the barriers to improving health and quality of life? And then what is the perception of the current um, disparities? And finally, um, do you see any emerging community health needs, especially among the underserved populations? Now, again, these are just uh, a few of the questions that we asked of many. So here's what we heard. Um, that we knew that geographic location and transportation was a big issue for our patients here at Midtown, rec Midtown recognizing that public transportation doesn't exist in many counties and where it does exist, it sometimes is unreliable, meaning you know, we can't count, you can't count on the schedule and then there's some disconnection from county to counties. Other things that we saw related to transportation is that many of our undersourced um, residents that we see here at Midtown don't have access to private transportation and then also may not be able to afford the public transportation system. And then some other information that, so hospitals in rural areas, so South Fulton and parts of Clayton and DeKalb counties um, don't um, have opportunities for comprehensive care. And so the nearest full service hospital can be several miles away. And with those transportation barriers, it can be a challenge getting there. So additional feedback related to access to care. So we know that our uninsured rates are high. You saw in a previous slide that we have about 14% of our, our patients here at Midtown are, un, are uninsured. Um, and we know that when patients don't have insurance that they delay seeking care until their symptoms really do become uh, really acute, um, which again, costs can go up from there. Um, additionally, we know that some of our uninsured patients that are diagnosed with chronic diseases like cancer or kidney disease don't have access to the ongoing treatment that they need. And so what's, what we see is that frequently those patients will visit the EDs um, in our area in a hospital that really over time increases medical bills. We also know that through these interviews and, and partnering with a lot of uh, these organizations that cost of prescription meds are really high and unaffordable for many of our patients. Uh, again, our patients seek ED care for preventable medical um, issues that have now become emergencies. So, you know, something that you can get treated at your primary care physician, like, you know, hypertension. Um, if you don't have meds to treat it, you actually see these patients show up in our emergency department seeking just really primary care um, treatment. And then lastly, um, we know that care coordination is limited for residents without a medical home. So it takes a while for appointments, meds, et cetera. Next slide. Um, and here, a couple other things. We know that employment opportunities have decreased in several of, the, of our service areas. Um, and then we know we have lack of uh, stable, good paying jobs in those areas where we see high poverty rates. And then the last thing that I'll share is um, some of the racial and ethnic challenges that um, patients in our service area experiences 
you know, higher stress level um, amongst um, people of color. And then we know that many residents within our service area resist seeking care because of the lack of culturally and linguistically relevant services that are available. And so while we know all of this, and this is the beginning, I think, of, of good of having a good understanding, um, we have lots of work to do. And, and that includes having a, a more robust data collection system. You know, we need to be able to do more risk screening. And then once we have better um, data, we need to be able to stratify and analyze that data so that we can begin to target um, some of our interventions um, to improve um, health inequity. And so I think the question for me was, how can nurse leaders um, implement successful strategies to advance health equities? Um, and this isn't going to be new. You heard this in some of the other presenters' um, information. The first thing that I would say is that I think we have to be aware. I don't think that without awareness, you can't have action. And so I think, you know, when I talk about awareness, I talk about that in, in, in a sense of two things. One is having a, an awareness that racial inequities exist. Some people don't believe that. And then one, recognizing what your own biases are around um, um, race. And then the second thing that I think that we can do as, as, as leaders, nurse leaders, is to advocate for diversity and inclusion on any of the boards or leadership structures that we are a part of. And then finally, if uh, and advocate for a strong health equity strategy. So if you have influence in your hospitals or whatever areas you work in, um, really push to have this as part of your strategy. I think that we, we need to do that if, and we need to always have it as top of mind. Um, and so it ensures that we're accountable to this work and that we can have change that is going to be meaningful when we have it on strategic plans. Thank you so much for that. You, you said so much. I, I wish I could just recap and I especially like the fact that you all did the community needs assessment. I think that speaks to the fact that you said we have to be aware. Was that, is that something that's unique to your leadership team or is that standard or? We do that as an Emory Healthcare system. Um, but obviously we have different needs for, for each of our hospitals. And so what I've shown you today is, is our, our specific Midtown information. Okay, thank you, that was great. Thank you for that. Uh, we'll move on to our last question for Dr. Trent Adams. Uh, the profession of nursing is well positioned to be a catalyst for change as it relates to addressing the inequities related to social determinants of health and structural violence. However, before that can happen, we as a profession must address challenges and biases that we face within our respective roles as nurses. Can you please share, Dr. Trent Adams, with us lessons learned when navigating the political landscape as a nurse leader and a woman of color on the national stage? Thank you, um, Katiana, for that um, question. And I, you would be surprised, I get asked that question a lot. How did you find your place in your space at the national level um, and it all stems from you know my my training. I would say Hampton University really did give me a perspective on who I was as as a nurse and where I stood as a professional. Um, and I would say over the course of my career in the military, the, the structure is very very different than it is in civilian nursing. But we learned how to be um, the best that we could be wherever we were. And I think fundamentally we have to be comfortable with our own power. We have to be comfortable using our voice. We also need to understand, um, as was stated by several of the panelists earlier, understand our biases and where we have blind spots. There's so many things in our, in our professional experience that are a product, if not a symptom, of our upbringing, our training, and the things that we've been exposed to. And many of our patients, and I want to talk about something that Brianna said, uh, many of our patients have not had the same journey that we have had. And that is the most important thing for all nurses to be aware of. Be very clear that your patients have not walked in your shoes and you definitely have not walked in their shoes. And we have to be sensitive and empathetic to their journey. Asking them um, what brought you here or you know, what's, what's happened to you is much better than what's wrong with you. The judgment that comes with just that one question is powerful. So using all those experiences and understanding that, and, and I'm an advocate for underserved communities and, and, and fighting for the underdog, that will always be a part of my core. I come from rural Virginia, where I, I grew up in Appomattox County where the Civil War ended. And there are a lot of things that have um, 
kind of shaped my view of the world. But I do believe that everyone has a right to health care. Everyone has a right to have a healthy environment to grow up in. Everyone has a right in this country to a, a, a robust, vigorous education that is able to meet their needs on the level where they are. So that lays a foundation for how I was able to navigate the national political stage. I did not see the national political stage any different than I did um, all the other positions that, I'd held, that I had held over the course of my career. I saw every position and every problem and every challenge, whether domestically or globally, as an opportunity to be a voice for those who could not speak up for themselves. And in that, in that realm, I used all of my educational preparedness um, academically and also experientially to be able to lead from the knowledge that uh, we all have something to bring to the table and we all have a perspective that is valuable to the community and to the patients we serve. But more importantly, not one of us, regardless of what our roles are, have more to gain or more to lose than getting the, getting the solutions right. So um, my, my approach was always, um, first of all, get as much information as you possibly can, do your research, do your homework. I'm a really good student. Know what you're talking about and know how to package it in a way that you can get the best outcome possible. So um, nurses need to learn how to put a suit on it. Learn how to understand this is a problem and it's my problem to deal with, but I don't have to um, disrupt everybody's, uh, everyone else's perspective in the room to get my point across. So communication is critical. Understanding that your worth and your value at that table is, is critical, but more importantly, execution and follow through. If you start a, a, if you start an engagement with a patient or community or an organization, you have to follow it through because it's how you build your credibility and you show that you are reliable and you are ethical and you have integrity in what you stand for. That in and of itself would give you the opportunity to be able to create a pathway for you to be able to make a difference. And so that is those are some of the tools that I used and um, they served me well. Thank you so much. That was so beautiful. It's so important that you said, you know, to, to honor the power that we have as individuals and how that impact can be pushed forward. And that level of empathy that you spoke to is so, so important in both empathizing with our own value and the value of others and seeing all of that on, on equal level playing field. So thank you so much for that, for that Dr. Trin Adams. So we have a question and answer. I think we have a few minutes here. We're, we're actually um, on schedule. Um, okay. So we have a few minutes to address a couple of questions from the q and I know we've been interacting with you throughout this time. So if you have any questions for any of our panelists, feel free to put them into the chat. Um, right now I have one question from Ebony Coleman, who Brianna, I, I believe she, uh, has, she said she volunteered with you Fridays at Good, Good Samaritan. Um, and she wants to ask what impact has COVID-19 had on your patient population? And she hopes that you and your staff are well. Thank you, Ebony. It's great to hear from you, first of all, and thank you just for your service. Um, we, uh, I would be remiss not to say that like we rely so heavily on just our community and our volunteers. Um, but yeah, COVID has, I, I kind of try to describe it as there's been two major impacts. One is just the disease itself on patients. Um, our population is highly um, frontline essential workers, people um, that are living in aggregate communities. Um, and sadly, at this point, the majority of my patients have either had COVID themselves or have had family members with COVID. Many have lost lives. Um, so it meant a lot of transitions for the clinic in terms of setting up um, a triage center. We found really early on that telehealth didn't work for a lot of our patients. Even phone calls were challenging for a lot of our patients. So finding a safe way to have open in-person access. Um, so running a triage center, running a testing center, we're now vaccinating about 100 people a week um, as a DPH site. Um, so there's been that shift, but I think the shift that I'm worried doesn't get a lot of attention and will be gone going is that primary care is going to be, especially if you're working in a population heavily impacted, a heavier and heavier list, lift, and that a lot of patients come in with a lot of grief and trauma. They have lost jobs. They have experienced the death of family members. They have had to experience death without being able to be in community, um, and they need a safe place to process that and they need to have validation of that those feelings and that stress does impact their health. 
Um, it's also meant, you know, sugars have gotten out of control that, you know, healthy practices have been pulled on hold for survival. And so I think that is something we're going to continue to see. Um, and how do we as, as staffs and as organizations prepare um, to meet people where they are, to start with compassion and validation um, and create space for that? Um, because it is easy just to go right back to the checklist and say, where did we get behind? What needs to be done? Those things matter, but only if we start by connecting with patients and letting them be who they need to be in that moment. Um, and just being able to support our staff in making sure that they are they are able and, and feel empowered and feel supported and what they need to do to bear that trauma that they, they process with those patients. But thank you for your question and for wishing us well. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, Katiana, would you like to pull another question from the Q&A? Sure. I'm I'm going to, one more. Can, I, can I add on to Brianna's um, comments? Um, what's really lovely about the model at Good Sam and what Brianna has done there with her team is where Clarkson Community Health Center would love to see ourselves 30 years from now. <laughs> we are five years in the making and we, um, rely 100% on our volunteer um, physicians, clinicians, uh, nursing students. We have a very tiny, small space that's 2,000 square feet. We're in the middle of a capital campaign um, during COVID, and we hope we've been approved to build an 8,000 square foot space um, that has a little bit modeled on um, what Brianna's uh, team has done at Good Sam. So we're I'm very grateful to, um, and I've actually taken um, students over on Fridays at Good Sam. So we're hoping to, now that um, a lot of our volunteers have been vaccinated and their um, parents are doing better and their students and their children are going back to school, we now have the ability in, in the following uh, weeks and months to start gently seeing patients face-to-face. -face. We are doing curbside consults um, with heaters um, doing point of care labs in, in a parking lot with a tent um, to make sure that we were maintaining all proper precautions. So um, certainly clinics like ourselves who are within the Georgia Volunteer Healthcare Program have been impacted because we rely on a lot of donor funds and um, individuals to uh, volunteer 100% of their care. And we have seen um, A1Cs rise as well as A1Cs drop as well. Um, and uh, again, look toward additional partnerships to help address the, the chronic stress um, that we are seeing from the COVID-19 pandemic and also the, you know, everything that has occurred over the last 12 months in terms of um, the social justice movements. Thank you both for responding to that. So I'm going to combine two questions that we have in the chat from a Georgia Jackson and an Adelaine, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly, McElroy. Um, so we have questions about the role of the black church um, in our communities, as well as how would small venues such as faith-based ministries increase vaccine participation? And to what degree do you feel that folks of color would receive vaccinations were they offered in a church setting? And that's open to any and all panelists. I could speak to that. Um, in Clarkston, we have Clarkson is a little bit like um, when I first moved to Georgia from the Midwest, um, there was a Circle K almost on every <laughs> block that I saw. Um, there are so many um, faith-based organizations in Clarkston. Right next to the Clarkson Community Health Center is the um, Clarkson First Baptist Church, which is predominantly African-American and Black um, American. And we held um, together with Ethne Health, the IRC, um, and Core Atlanta uh, vaccine distribution of Moderna. And it was um, very successful utilizing um, spaces. Um, we've been talking about how do we bring vaccine to apartment complexes? How do we partner with faith-based organizations to offer vaccine? Now in Georgia, we're only at phase 1A, but we hope to um, partner um, a little bit more closely as Georgia opens up as well. So we're excited to vaccinate our educators and others who meet those, um, those phased um, requirements in the state of Georgia. 
I just want to add that if any of you are working with, whether it be a faith community or anywhere where you do see just there's a need for safe discussion about the vaccines, I do work with another organization that has worked to create toolkits that help you become a facilitator and um, how to get those conversations happening. Because I do think people trust the spaces where they have community most. So um, I'll put my email in the chat, but I'm happy, I know our time is limited, but I'm happy to link you to folks that could get you resources. Because I think that's a real key is just getting people to have um, platforms within their own communities to help build trust. Thank you for those. Um, and we have two minutes left. So we think we'll ask one more question and then we'll move into our next segment. Um, this comes from Dr. Glenna Brewster. She says, great presentations. And she wants to know, how do you all care for yourselves in managing this capacity? And how do you deal with this and managing these disparities daily? She wants to know how you're doing basically, truthfully. And that's for any of our panelists. Maybe Chief, it's a matter of taking one, yeah. this is Sylvia. Um, I think okay. it's a matter of taking one day at a time. I think there's been so much variability um, in um, the things that have happened uh, over this past year. And it's been challenging, not only the, the responsibilities of the professional world, but then there are family members who have a lot of anxiety and then you know, kids and my kids, one of my, my youngest daughter is in college. So transitioning, all, being all those demands of every, every other sector of your life has been um, quite interesting. But I, I do believe um, nurses specifically have really, you know, they felt the brunt of a lot of the direct care and the burnout is real. I think the day-to-day -day, um, drama and trauma of just living through this pandemic is going to, it's, it is having and has had a significant impact on our entire profession. On a personal level, I think we need to be checking on each other. Um, we're checking on family members, but I think it's, it's time for us to take care of ourselves and understand that we too um, are very valuable, not only to our, to our patients, but to our families and to ourselves. We've got to put ourselves first at some point. And this is an area that we often do very poorly in, self-care. And, and I think it's important for us to take a take a, a moment just to pause and say that that is really something that's important for us going forward. Absolutely, so important. It was very telling that everyone was a bit quiet when that question <laughs> was answered. All right, thank you all so much for your questions. Uh, very poignant questions. Sorry that we are not able to get to all of them. We're going to wrap up our panel at this time and move forward with our program. Thank you so much to our speakers, to our panelists for your expertise in participating and joining with us today. Let's take all of these essential conversations and nuggets of wisdom to continue intentional action, face difficult truths and deepen our commitment to each other and justice as a united front towards equity. Thank you all so much for your participation today and we'll move on to the next section of our program. Thank you. Wow, thank you everybody for that inspirational and provoking conversation. I'm so grateful to our panelists and moderators for this the excellent conversation. Hello everyone, my name is Marifel Verlor and I'm the Director of Alumni Engagement for the School of Nursing. The School of Nursing continues to make strides in diversity and inclusivity for all. And I would now like to introduce a trailblazing alumnus who is an inspirational leader for the School of Nursing and Emory University, alumnus Dr. Dante Flanagan. Dr. Dante Flanagan graduated from Oxford College in 2004 and received his BSN from the Nell Hudson Woodruff School of Nursing in 2006. Dr. Flanagan received his CRNA from Stanford University in 2010 and his DNP from Columbia University in 2017. Dr. Flanagan has served as a board member of the Diversity Nurse Anesthesia Mentoring Program, as well as an active member of the American Association of Nurse Anesthetists, a founding member of National Black Nurses Association of Greater New York City, and a former member of the Oxford College of Emory alumni. In between all that, he's also found time to write a book, Dream Big and Awaken to Your Possibilities, which was published in 2020. 
Dr. Flanagan is the president-elect for the Nurses Alumni Association Board and will be the first male to hold that position. Dr. Flanagan is also the first alumni donor to give to the Emory Nursing Learning Center, our new building in Decatur. Dr. Flanagan, thank you so much for your inspirational leadership and generosity, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Mary Phil, and thank you for everyone for having me. Um, I want to come to you and just just give some words as the new president elect for the um, Nursing Alumni Association and just speaks volumes to what is happening over at Emory and in, in the path of diversity and inclusion. Um, one of the key things that jumped out in this wonderful lecture that we hear today is um, the action oriented nature of everything that's that's going on around us from the high level corporations down to um, the community based organizations as well. And Dr. Trent Adams, thank you so much for sharing um, all the information that you presented to us. And I think one of the other things that stood out to me was cultural humility. It was a theme that we talked that is getting some traction in our in our world of nursing, but I think is it's valuable for us to continue to dive into that as we humble ourselves in front of our patients and um, as we move forward and trying to change for the future and improve um, equity and um, diversity inside of the healthcare field. Um, I come to you from a space of a specialty of nurse anesthesia and my work um, in the last 10, five years specifically, but 10 years as a nurse anesthetist has been um, working toward mentoring and um, changing the experience of students inside of the nurse anesthesia programs. Like most of um, the country and institutions across the map, we still have a lack of diversity in um, our student population, which leads to a lack of um, diversity in our healthcare professionals afterwards. And the research has shown that the graduates, minority graduates tend to go back and serve into those communities that are under um, underserved with the most disparities. And so in order to help alleviate those problems on down the line, we have to continue to push forward to um, increase diversity. And one of the things that we do is mentoring nurse, I mean, um, ICU nurses and nurses that have a passion for going into anesthesia. Um, that involves um, prepping for interviews, that involves um, working on recommendation letters and personal statements. But beyond that, it, we also have had the opportunity in the past um, year plus to give out scholarships and GRE um, prep um, award for programs. Um, another one of the other pieces that we're also doing is uh, we're partnering with schools, including um, Emory to discuss wellness support groups for students of minority backgrounds inside of these educational systems as they go through. Um, the research shows that support groups are needed because there is a difference between um, how information is perceived and how students of, of color are um, given information and treated in, in terms of support systems. And so there has to be a way to balance that. Um, I love the question of how you're dealing with your mental health as providers, but it's also important to realize that there is a, the mental health begins before we are licensed practitioners. And if we don't address that beforehand, then we, bring that trauma upon completion of school. Um, one of the things, one of the ways to do that is leading toward creating safe spaces for students and for faculty involvement. And as of one of the things I want to share with, um, with you is that we are currently working on continuing that as we saw that the hidden figures um, component of bringing these, these very important people from the, the hidden spaces into the light and showcasing them in the um, nursing school this year um, my wife and i decided to push the limits and give back in a way that would help leave a lasting effect for years to come um emory has been a place of opportunity and influence and um with this great obligation and responsibility to those before and after us and we want to continue to push that narrative and break barriers against black people and other people of color as we increase awareness um to the importance of equity and the route to eliminating disparities in our community um, with that said, we chose to continue our mission by um, giving to the Emory Nursing Learning Center with the naming of a new Flanagan Solidarity Student Lounge, with the vision being to create a space that's 
increases a feeling of shared acceptance while giving students a, a comfortable and inclusive um, lounge space. For us, having this space not only becomes a, a living active bowl to diversity, but it ensures our family will be tied to the right side of history here at Emory for the foreseeable future. And given the time of heightened diversity discussion and initiatives, it's important Emory remain action oriented as it continues to shape the lives of the future with its leaders of today. And as we move into the next chapter, I believe that we have a we have a leader who is also committed to that end, and it's very clear and present in her approach and her dedication to that. Um, and as I close, um, with that being said, I'd like to lead this um, on to introduce to Dean McCauley and let her close out with um, the remarks for the rest of the day. Thank you, Dante. Hi, everyone. It's good to have spent the afternoon with you. It, uh, I hope that you get the sense of how special Ada Fort has been to the history of the school and how every day we try to move forward, um, living and breathing the wonderful things that she started uh, when she was a dean here. Um, I wanna give a special thanks to our keynote, Dr. Sylvia Trent Adams. What a phenomenal leader and inspiration for all of us. We really hate that you couldn't be with us today, but we are sending something in the mail to you on, your, on its way to your office, uh, a small token of thanks. I also wanna thank the panelists. I learned so much about the incredible work you're doing at the Good Samaritan Clinic in Clarkston and um, how Emory Healthcare, um, as shown with Midtown, gets to know its community and um, its special needs. Um, we're gonna have a recording of today's speakers available for everyone. I've already gotten text wanting to know if the hidden figures video is going to be up and I'm assuring everyone that it will be because I think I'd like to watch it again and, and listen and read uh, more intently. It's fabulous. Thank you for doing that project. It was the first time I saw it today along with the rest of you and I'm so very proud. Um, we do have continuing education credits for those of you who are interested. It's just really important that you complete the evaluation that's going to be coming uh, via email to each of you to get those free continuing education credits. And then I wanna say something to the students that joined us today to remember the words of Dr. Trent Adams and, and know that um, as nurses, as a group, we have power as the largest profession, but each of you as individuals need to find your voice and power and, and move forward with us to make the, the world a better place for everyone and greater health for everyone. So um, thank you for being with us today. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. And, I hope we get together uh, in the same room together the next time. So goodbye, everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs>